Will you join me in a word of prayer this morning? O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Therefore, choose life. I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, listening to his voice, and holding fast to him. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 19 to 20 from our Old Testament lesson today. Those verses are going to set the table for our message. You may notice as I read those to you that I changed the translation of one of the words to listen. Listen to his voice rather than obey his voice. The way that the ESV translation that we shared just a moment ago here in the service and that you have printed in your service folder has it translated. I'll say more about that in just a minute. But for now, picture, if you would, that you're seated in your favorite restaurant. No, no finer than that. You're seated in a quality establishment. I'm not sure what your favorite restaurant is. Picture a quality establishment. You're seated in a place where the host or hostess treats you like a dignitary. You're seated in a place whose menu is filled with so many fine and savory items that your mouth is beginning to water as you notice they're already being placed on tables adjacent to you and you haven't even looked at the menu yet. It's a place that has the grandest view in the whole of the region. Price is no obstacle. You can order to your appetite's content. You been in that situation before? No. <laughs> when I first accepted the position to Sigma Aldrich Chemical Company in St. Louis, Missouri, they brought me to town to look for housing, even though I was just graduated from college four hours away and I, my hometown was St. Louis. They did this at the time for all of their newly recruited professional and managerial employees. They brought us to town, put us up in the finest hotel in downtown St. Louis, the one with the revolving restaurant on the 28th floor of the tower. Top of the riverfront, it was called. It commanded the best views of the city and the surrounding landscape. Dinner that night was on the company. It may have been the first time in my life that I ordered without considering the prices on the menu. Well, since I was a kid anyway. I do remember one time when I was at Red Lobster with my family and I thought because I was a kid and the name of the restaurant was Red Lobster that I should order the lobster because that's the name of the restaurant. That's what you should do, right? except that my parents explained to me in an age-appropriate way the subtleties of family budgets and economics, and I think I ended up with clams and hush puppies or something. I was no longer a child. I was embarking on my first real career, and I ordered whatever I wanted. I'll have this for starters. I'll have this as a salad. I'll have this entree. I don't remember exactly what I ordered, but I do remember ordering a glass of very expensive Zinfandel that my 22-year-old palate wasn't refined enough for. <laughs> Other than that, what I really remember, though, is being able to just order to my heart's desire. When Moses, whom the book of Hebrews calls the servant of all God's house, comes to us in Deuteronomy chapter 30, the Old Testament lesson for today, and sets the table before us, I wonder if we often perceive it in that sort of a culinary atmosphere. As if Moses is there ready to take our order and God is the chef in the kitchen ready to deliver it. I'll have this blessing oh, and I'll have this blessing and for starters I'll have this blessing and I'll top it all off with this blessing. Now I haven't filled in those blessings. Put your own favorite entree in there. I'll have this, my dream job, the one that pays well and has great benefits, although not very much responsibility and a lot of time off. I, I want enough finances and vacation so that I can travel to sunswept beaches or cruise all those historic destinations worldwide. I want a loving spouse that I can spend this time with. What about successful children? 
who are on track for families and careers of their own, and grandchildren who want to spend time with me, and families that are together in church, especially on the holidays. Well, these might be the main entrees on the list, right? Of the blessings that we would ask for. But then there are those side entrees that we ask for too. We could really use some new carpeting in the living area of the house. It's getting a little beaten down. Oh, and that travel trailer we'd like to have for those weekend excursions. Oh, and while we're talking about weekends, how about some good friends that we can spend that time with? Good, lifelong friends. I don't need to read the whole menu to you. You've been reading off this menu your whole life. Not only reading off of it, you've been ordering off of it. Asking God for these blessings and waiting for him to deliver. But what about that other section of the menu? Maybe the one that we haven't looked at. The one nobody likes to look at. Moses said, see I have set before you today life and death. Blessing and curse. There's things on this menu that I haven't seen on the menu of any upscale eatery. Now, I have been in restaurants where I wondered if something that I ordered off this menu was going to turn into a curse later. But that's not what's going on here. Nobody has seen a section of a menu at a restaurant that says appetizers, entrees, blessings, curses. And yet at the top of the riverfront in St. Louis, Missouri, when the hostess seats you at the table and gives you the menu, they don't leave you to peruse the menu on your own, not in a fine establishment. Short order, the server comes over and begins to explain all the delicacies and delights of that particular menu to you. And this is what happens in Deuteronomy chapter 30 as well. God not only sets the menu, but God begins to announce it to people. So even before the people of God had a chance to read this off of God's menu, the blessings, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 to 14, 14 entrees full of blessing, or the curses, Deuteronomy chapter 28, 15 through 68, 54 entrees of curses. The chapter before, Deuteronomy chapter 27, verses 11 to 14, Moses charged the people to have these presented out loud antiphonally from the mountains surrounding them. The blessings heralded winsomely from Mount Gerizim, the curses shouted frightfully from Mount Ebal. The Lord will cause you to be prosperous in the fruit of your womb and in the fruit of your livestock and in the fruit of your land and all the land that the Lord your God swore to your fathers to give you. Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 11. A nation that you do not know will come and eat of the fruit of your labors and you will be only oppressed continually. Deuteronomy 28 verse 33. That's the menu? Moses, I'll have the blessing please. The Lord your God will open his good treasury to you. He will open the heavens and send rain on your land in its season. And he will bless all the fruit of your hands. Deuteronomy 28 verse 12. You will carry much seed out into the field, but you will gather little for the locusts will eat all of it. Deuteronomy 28 verse 38. Moses, I'll have the blessing, please. The beginning of our lesson, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15 said, See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. Moses, we want life. Life. Life today. Life always. Life, Moses. Right? So how do we choose life? That's the verses in between. Verse 16. If you listen. Again, I'm putting the word listen in there. Listen to the commandments of the Lord your God that I'm commanding you today. By loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, and keeping his commandments and the statutes and his just decrees, then you shall live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 16. 
Okay, what if we order wrong? Well, that's verse 17 and 18. But if your heart turns away and you will not hear and are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today, then you will surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you're going over the Jordan to possess. So walk in the ways of the Lord your God and find blessing in life. Disregard the ways of the Lord your God and find curses and death. Seems pretty simple, right? How we order one rather than the other. Except now look around for a minute at the tables of your loved ones and of your coworkers and of your neighbors and of your friends and what's being served on their tables. And you might notice an unnerving pattern. This unnerving pattern, and I quote, it is the same for all. Since the same event happens to the righteous and to the wicked, to the good and to the evil, to the clean and to the unclean, to him who sacrifices and to him who does not sacrifice. So, as it is for the good, it is for the sinner. The same events happen to all. End quote. I'm quoting because I'm not just making that observation myself. This observation is from the wisdom of Solomon. This observation comes to us from a person who was receiving blessing after blessing from God through his entire life. But looking around, began to recognize and wrote in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 1 and 3, that it doesn't seem to make any difference whether somebody walks in the way of the Lord or whether somebody doesn't. The same event seems to happen to everybody. It, it was disheartening enough for Solomon that it turned him away from walking in the ways of the Lord his God at all. First Kings chapter 11 verse 4 says, And when Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart away after other gods, away from wholly following the Lord his God. And then after describing the many different gods that he built altars in high places to, 1 Kings chapter 11 summarizes verse 6 saying, Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And yet, Solomon dies old of age, full of children and grandchildren, full of blessings in his life. Full of blessing, but disillusioned in spirit. Disillusioned from this life of just ordering up God's blessings, one blessing after another. Treating God's blessings as a menu to be ordered from. He was already experiencing that disillusion when he wrote the Proverbs, which is why in Proverbs chapter 27, verse 20, he said, Shaol and Abaddon are never satisfied. Neither are the eyes of man ever satisfied. In other words, blessings after blessings are never enough. And the curse of death comes to everyone. Not only is Solomon, a man whose life was filled with blessings, disillusioned by this, but you also have in the scriptures the account of Job. Here's a man whose life was filled with obedience. And yet his life was also filled with curses. And then there are modern day Jobs. People like Elie Weissel. Elie was a young adolescent at 12 years old who didn't go out in the neighborhood and play with all the other kids his age because after school he spent time studying the Talmud the Talmud, which is centuries of rabbis' commentaries on the words of Moses in the Old Testament, like Deuteronomy chapter 30, which is our Old Testament lesson for today. So in Seget, Hungary, where he grew up, at that young age of 12, he would spend his afternoons studying the Talmud, and then he would go back to the synagogue in the evenings to spend the evenings talking with the elders about what he had been learning. Sometimes they are so late at night 
that his parents wondered if he was going to be coming home. Francois Moriac, who writes the foreword to Elie Weissel's book, Night, described Elie this way. He said, from the time when his conscience first awoke, he lived only for God, dedicated to the eternal. And yet at 12 years old, that was the year 1944, when Ellie and his family and all of his neighbors and all of the Jews of his hometown were deported to Auschwitz. And not only did he witness his family members and his loved ones and his neighbors and many others systematically killed, that is what sealed the coffin on his life of faith too. Years later, he wrote this, Never shall I forget those moments which murdered my God and my soul and turned my dreams to dust. Whether it's the disillusionment of Solomon, who spent his years of life with blessing, or a modern-day Job like Elie Weissel, who spent his years dealing with the lifelong memories of those curses of the concentration camps in World War II. These act for us, these two lives, they act for us as a modern and real life commentary on Deuteronomy chapter 30 that prevent us from taking Moses' writings there as if God's blessings are something we can simply order up like entrees off a menu through our obedience, leaving the curses just to those who by their neglect of God choose it for themselves. Elie Weissel, after he survived the concentration camps, went on to become a journalist. And even though he was a writer, he self-imposed a 10-year vow of silence on himself before he would ever write about the horrors he experienced in the concentration camps. And it was during those 10 years that he was assigned to interview Francois Mauriac, who was a renowned French writer and novelist. But in their conversation, Elie began sharing some of his story. And it was later Mauriac who encouraged Elie Weissel to write his first volume about what he had experienced. But thinking back to that initial conversation with Elie Weissel, Moriak wrote this. He says, And I, who believe that God is love, what answer could I give my young questioner? Did I speak of that other Jew, his brother, who may have resembled him, the crucified, whose cross conquered the world? Did I affirm the stumbling block of his faith was the cornerstone of mine, that the conformity between the cross and the suffering of men was, in my eyes, the key to the impenetrable mystery whereon upon the faith of his childhood had perished. For we do not know the worth of a single drop of blood or a single tear, but all is grace. If the eternal is eternal, then the last word of each one of us belongs to him. And this I should have said to my, this Jewish child but I could only embrace him, weeping. We don't know the cost of a single drop of blood or a single tear. Christ knew the cost, and Christ chose that blood, those tears, by his obedience. He chose to pay that cost for us. And this had always been a stumbling block to disciples. It was a stumbling block to the first disciples, which is why even after they first recognized and were able to put into words that this was the Christ, the Son of the living God, in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus began to tell them what that meant. Verse 21 of Matthew 16, from that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised Jesus was showing them that the path to life was going to be through death and suffering. And then Peter, verse 22, took him aside and rebuked him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Why? Because Christ, you are the obedient one. You fulfilled everything that Moses said. 
What's coming to you and to all who follow you is nothing but blessing. But Jesus replied, verse 24 and 25, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Matthew 16, 24 and 25. And Christians have ever since called this the way of the cross. The way of the cross is that we don't expect blessing in return for our obedience. The way of the cross is holding fast to faith, even in the crucible of senseless hardship. The way of the cross is continuing to give and to give without expectation of return because this is what our Lord Jesus did for us. So what then of the words of Moses? I have set before you life and death, blessings and curse, therefore choose life. Aren't these the words of God? I'll let the Apostle Paul answer that. Galatians chapter 3, the Apostle quotes from this same section of Deuteronomy, this same section of blessing and curses from the words of Moses. He quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 26, in order to say in Galatians 3, verse 10, all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it's written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law and do them. That's the quote from Deuteronomy 27, verse 26. What Paul is saying is that no one is able to order up blessings and only blessings by their obedience. And even to attempt to do so leaves us under the curse because all have fallen short. But Paul doesn't leave it there either. He goes on in verse 11 to say, but the one who is righteous by faith shall live. For the law is not faith, but rather the one who does them shall live by them. No, Christ redeemed us from that curse of the law by becoming the curse for us. Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 through 13. Christ became the curse for us. But though we're not cursed by trying to live up to that curse of the law anymore. And instead, our righteousness is by faith. So now we get back to why I've changed the word obey to listen at the beginning of this sermon in these verses from Moses. It's because that word in Hebrew is the word shema, which can in some contexts mean to obey. But in a broader sense, it simply means to hear, to listen, and to take to heart. And it's a pretty good general bet that anytime you see the word obey in your Old Testament in the English translation, it's really the word listen, which is why Paul, who says that it's those who are righteous by faith shall live in Galatians chapter 3, verse 11, is the Paul who says in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, that faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. And so, do you want to choose life? Faith is the way to choose life. Faith in life's blessed moments, but holding fast to faith even in life's worst moments. Because through his work on the cross, Christ has opened to us life eternal. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, listening to his voice, and holding fast to him. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 19 to 20. In Jesus' name, amen.